So yeah, welcome to the webinar. We are usually doing UX workshops in Luxembourg, but due to pandemics at the moment, we are mostly like uh, playing around a little bit around the world and doing like a presentation and um, maybe workshops again soon about UX design. So I'm Laurence. <laughs> and I'm Stephanie. <laughs> so we, I, we were presented. Earlier, you need so. to, to remind the, the, the rule of the socks, though. Yeah, there's a rule because everybody thinks, like many, many people think we are the same exact person. But uh, in case we, you can see that we are both uh, two, <laughs> two, 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 two different people. And there's like many differences. Like I've got tattoos, she's got piercings and stuff like that. So the first person who called me Stephanie and called her Laurence uh, are supposed to buy us socks. One pair for each, uh, each other. That's the rule. <laughs> My mom got us confused. <laughs> yeah, so, can yeah. you imagine that? <laughs> so, but that's a rule. Oh, no. Okay, so yeah. oh, I, I ah, opened that's me. <laughs> there was a link. <laughs> ah, no, what did I do? Wait, I, I'm good at technology. Okay, that's good. So okay, yeah, so the plan what's... for today. Okay, uh, first uh, we are going about uh, to discuss about uh, what are the cognitive biases. Then we know it's scary, so we created some cards to help you. And then we are going to go a little bit further. So a uh, small introduction to what are cognitive biases. It's that. <laughs> it's the whole, so this is the whole wheel of cognitive biases. I think there's more so than scary. 100 things and... Yay! So that's Until it. Thanks for coming. No, you know everything about cognitive. No. No, so no, no, no. Real definition. Uh, so you have to understand that basically like 90%, I think, of our decision um, are made on an unconscious level. So whenever you think you actually decided something, actually there's a good chance that your brain decided uh, for you. <laughs> and then it's just, you're just trying to rationalize your, um, your decision. So cognitive biases, there are psychological uh, tendencies that cause the human brain to draw incorrect conclusion. Uh, in order to navigate our daily life, we actually need our brain to take shortcuts. Otherwise, imagine that every time you breathe, every time you do something, Every time you move, like I'm moving my hands a lot, all of that, if you, if those were a conscious uh, decision, it would be super complex for you. So the thing with uh, cognitive biases is, is this happens when your brain is actually drawing those incorrect conclusions. And for better or worse, we can use them in many different ways to influence user behavior in our website, in our app, whenever we are building or designing something. So you might, and I say might, be familiar <laughs> with this website <laughs> because it's like from the life before. Um, and basically there's, their business model is just based on cognitive biases. You know, you've got like everything is trying to influence you, uh, but they don't uh, clearly lie to you, but they do everything to make you think there's something that can like put pressure uh, on you or that you should buy this, uh, like uh, you, should, you should book this room or another one. And uh, it's just uh, like, let, let's be honest, um, if you like all your website is just based on cognitive biases, I really think like ethically, from, like from an ethical point of view, that sucks. So, um, for example, uh, take this room, uh, what you, when you see like, oh, just one room left on our website. And basically what you think is just like, if I don't book now, there will be no, no room for me, uh, left for me later. So basically it's just like, they don't tell you that exactly. They just tell you, oh, by the way, there's just one room left on our site. Maybe there's like plenty on other side, but right now you've got like many, many, a lot of pressure on you. So that is precisely like uh, two biases at the same time. It's scarcity. So there's just one room left and loss aversion. Like if, if I lose this one, I will lose everything. So that's a good example of a bias. Like booking <laughs> is just full of biases. Um, then we've got another bias, uh, the one when they say like, oh, it's high demand, like book 22 times in the last 24 hours. So you think like, wow, other, other people booked it. Maybe I should do it too, because like 22 person, they, they cannot be wrong, you know, and they don't tell you that. They don't tell you like, who you're going to miss that. 
but you think you're gonna miss that. So that's the bandwagon effect, thinking like, wow, every, all the cool, cool kids in the room are, are booking this room. So I just need the, I, I just need this one as well. So this is another bias, like the bandwagon effect. We will talk about those two, uh, those biases um, uh, later, uh, like in, like more in detail. So yeah, as designers, but it's also interesting to see those things as, as customers. Actually, it's uh, really interesting to be aware of such biases. And some might influence also your user research, even uh, if you don't know about those, or some of those might influence the way you behave with other beings, like in teams, especially if you're remote and it's a little bit more complicated regarding it, um, discussion and stuff like that. Um, so what we decided to do, you remember this kind of super scary wheel, there's like 100 of those. Not all of those biases might apply uh, in UX design or especially when you're building or designing digital products. So we took uh, 52 of those and we created this kind of card game. And we wanted to make it a little bit easier for people to understand their own biases, but also like communicate those biases uh, with the rest of the team. So it looks something like that. It's a really nice <laughs> printed artifact. It's yeah. really fun to play with those cards in face-to-face uh, -face workshops, but we also have a solution now for like remote workshops. Yeah. And don't be afraid. You can see that on the image, it's in French, but we've got the deck in French mm -hmm. and also in English. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't have a nice uh, picture in, in English. So yeah, we have two things. Uh, you can find all of that on the website. So we created this uh, PDF where you can print all of the uh, the cards. It's free, uh, it's, uh, it's open source. So if you want to train some stuff, uh, just contact us and I can even give you the AI file or something. And we also created this kind of little website, which is basically we took the biases uh, definition that we kind of rewrote some of them to make them a little bit easier to understand. And we created this. this small kind of web app if you're in a meeting it's a little bit maybe easier to have a web app than actually having the cards so let's take a look at uh, a few examples i forget to mention that we actually split those in uh, five different categories so we will present the categories and for each category an example of two different biases so let's start with all the decision making and behavior uh, biases. So uh, basically, these biases are, are the things that uh, affect uh, people's ability to make decisions. Because you base your decision on the information you can get, and sometimes it can mislead you. And when I say you, it may be you as a designer, but also it will mislead your users. So we've got the first one, which is anchoring. Yeah, so anchoring biases is a tendency for people to depend too heavily of an initial uh, piece of information. So usually uh, this is kind of used for better or worse. Um, if you go in a restaurant, for instance, you see there's kind of weird items in the menu. You see that one item is super expensive, but it's not super interesting, like a super expensive salad. Uh, if you compare it to the price of the pizza or the, um, the meat, it's kind of weird to see that expensive thing. But what it's creating is creating this kind of item that is used as a comparison. So now when you see uh, this kind of super expensive salad and you have a pizza that is kind of a little bit less expensive, you might draw a conclusion, which is, ah, oh, actually the pizza is best value for me because I this kind of uh, super expensive salad or whatever the meal it is, created this kind of anchoring bias. And now you are just basically comparing the prices uh, of the things on the menu based on the cheapest one and the um, the uh, most exp expensive one. It's the same usually when you have like this um, website where you have some tables with different options. You see sometimes one of these options is super strange. It's not really an interesting option. It's like you may even say you get less for more money, but usually this kind of option is again here to create this kind of anchoring bias to frame your thinking around that and kind of uh, draw you towards one of the other options uh, on that uh, table. And Udemy is a good example of that. So Udemy, basically what they have, you, um, you have it here. You have the kind of regular price of um, the training and you see it's kind of a striped out and you see it's uh, nine, um, 10 euros. So what this creates is like basically, again, it's anchoring bias. Normally, uh, now your brain is like, 
oh, actually, this should be um, super expensive. And then I'm, I'm going to pay like 10% the price of that. So otherwise, you might think, OK, I don't know if your 10 is expensive or not. But here, it creates this kind of reference where you might say, oh, yeah, it's a super interesting offer because the normal price is like uh, 10 times um, more expensive, something something like that. Then we've got the IKEA effect. Uh, this one is really nice because it's uh, it got the tendency for people to display a uh, high value on object, they, uh, as they say, partially absent themselves. So this could be an IKEA table that you just take uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes to do this, but then it's your table. You did it yourself. And it's a and it's this effect that we are looking for in this uh, in this bias is basically what uh, you if you take time to custom something or to do it yourself it will have like more value i don't know for people here because maybe like uh, i'm in mean the millennials people <laughs> but uh, is there anybody who just uh, remember how much time we spent uh, customizing winamp the winamp skins because we took so much time. We, even if this player, like uh, this uh, Winamp player uh, has like not such a good value, you know, it was just software to play music. We, we spent so much time putting like choosing the skin and customizing everything. We just, we wouldn't change for, for, for another one. So this, uh, this kind of uh, IKEA effect, it's also the same when you uh, spend some time to customize a website. So uh, we've got MySpace in the, <laughs> like a really, really long time ago, but, uh, and then it can be like any app where you let your people, uh, your users choose the colors, the font, or anything. If you spend much more um, uh, a bit of time to 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 custom it, you will put like more value. It will value more for you, and uh, that's uh, that's kind of fun because uh, <laughs> IKEA it's not you know it's not the it's kind of cheap, but people love love their uh, furniture anyway. So I'm lost. Uh, so the second category, the blue one, if you're not colorblind, but if you're colorblind, we also have small icons, is uh, thinking and problem, problem solving. So this is the kind of biases that uh, change the way people think and really uh, draw them to uh, get some wrong conclusions. Ah, the fear of missing out. This one is <laughs> basically uh, the reason why you had like 20 more people asking you last minute if they could uh, f uh, come and uh, resist register to this event or something like that. There's a lot of events online now and it's kind of a little... Uh, a little bit strange because I know that I subscribe to some events just because I wanted to have the link to the event afterwards. So I was, I knew I was not going be, to be able to attend the event, but still I was fearing that I was missing something out of that event and I really wanted to have a, the link to see the replay of the event. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, it's called FOMO, so fear of missing out, and it's a horrible, horrible, horrible bias. And unfortunately, a lot of websites, like especially social um, media websites, are trying to play on that fear of missing out, which is basically this anxiety that maybe something is going on somewhere. I need to know about it. And I think it got worse and worse in the, the last year with every uh, one of those social platforms and everything. So this one is a really tricky one. It can be an interesting one to use in some designs but it's usually something that might backfire really, really quickly, especially if you care about the well-being of your users. So again, only three room left. My fear of missing out is like, oh my God, I need to book that, otherwise there will not be any rooms. And then you book it and you come back and there's still only three room left. So <laughs> it's just like completely fake, but still, that's the horrible thing. Like. I know psychology, I like play around with those cards and I, we, we basically like uh, talk about this all the time. And still I can't get over this fear of missing out. And there's even a bias that is like a, a bias that you think you don't have any biases, which is a bias on its own. Like, I don't remember the name, but it's basically, yeah, I think I'm, I'm totally unbiased. Like, no, this is not possible. So that's the, the worst thing is like, you can be kind of, you know about those biases, you see them on the website. And still your brain is hardwired to, to react to those, which is meh, <laughs> annoying to say the least. 
Then we've got the bandwagon effect. So we discussed a, bit, uh, a little bit about it before, but basically it's the uh, best booking example with the eight person that looking at this hotel, you're going to miss it. So that's like eight, per, eight person can just cannot be wrong. So just want to go with all the, the, the other people. But I think that's like another example. And I think I designers, you will, uh, I know oh, no, that was before. <laughs> Sorry, Steph, can you switch that? Just like you, love the effect. But uh, basically, it's the the, the moment when uh, you are uh, working and presenting something to a group of people, and it's called like the design by committee. And you got a feedback about something. First, everybody seems really really happy, and then you've got just one user who tell like. Yeah, but I'm not sure of that. And then everybody follows that. And this is also the bandwagon effect. And you switch like uh, you you can end up from like a really good feedback to uh, like really an the, the 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 horrible meeting in like a few seconds. And basically the bandwagon effect it's just the lemmings. You know they they just like fall and fall and fall and they die because everybody's following the first one. And then you end up with things like this. So. Just uh, next time, you, if if you ever book again in, uh, <laughs> in uh, on Booking.com, just think about the lemmings like dying in the lava. <laughs> no. Uh, then we've got like the uh, another category about uh, memories and recalling. So unless you have a hard drive instead of a brain, your memory is not perfect and can be biased. Uh, this bias will play with your memory, with like uh, enhancing or impairing what you or you your users recall. And uh, uh, for that, we got I, I let Stephanie talk. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Primacy, uh, yeah, primacy effect. Uh, so usually items near the end of a sequence uh, are the easiest to recall, followed by items at the, be uh, at the beginning of a sequence. This is why, for instance, on some interfaces, you have like the um, most important item, if you're uh, in a language that is le left to right, is going to be at the top right. Maybe I can unshare my screen. No, can I show you? Yeah, here. So I'm mostly interested into that one. I'm going to go here and uh, present. And it, there's a reason why this is at here. It's like if you read left to right, the first item will be the logo. I don't really care about the logo here. And the last one will be this present little button. And usually you see that also in like sequences. And I hope I'm back on the right. Yeah. Um, uh, the thing is, once you're kind of aware of that, you, you can cheat a little bit, like you can cheat in meetings and stuff like that. Because if people remember uh, what was happening at the beginning and what was happening at the end and not really what's happening in the middle, it means that at the beginning, you need to have this kind of super strong agenda. And at the end of the meeting, you also need to have this kind of, again, reminding the agenda, reminding um, people about decisions, stuff like that. So once you are kind of aware of those kind of things, you can apply them to website design, but also to every aspect of a life of, of a designer to make it a little bit um, less uh, complicated. And then we've got the bizarreness effect. So I, I, as a designer, I really think that everybody should have a fa favorite bias to, to know and to love and to share. Because so it's, it's always good to, to have like a, a good example to talk about biases. So for me, bizarreness effect is just like uh, basically uh, the main reason that I still have a job and I can go to uh, a job interviews <laughs> because you know when you've got like tattoos arm blue or green hair it depends on the moment uh, people just are curious about it and it would be the same for uh, bizarre material in general that you remember uh, it can be just like uh, if, if you are scrolling on a website if you see something like a little bit disturbing or a little bit bizarre you will want to see it and you can play with that with your users. And people in general just uh, uh, remember and recall um, weird things or weird people like me <laughs> much better and much more than like a uh, simple and uh, say traditional thing. <laughs> Uh, so the last, uh, the next category, sorry, is uh, the biases that will influence you as a UX designer when you're doing the interview, but also influence your users. So you need to be aware of those. And again, we're giving you two examples of each, but there's more in the card. Um, 
So courtesy bias is a quite an annoying one because it's going to mess up a lot of the uh, declarative data you're going to collect. When you ask people about their opinion, there's this kind of tendency to give a, a socially correct opinion uh, rather than their true opinion because they don't want to offend you. Yeah, it's the same. You should ask them, do you like the design? Like the courtesy bias will kind of... <laughs> Tell them they don't want to piss you off. Even if you're like, yeah, I'm not the person who designed this. You can be honest, but all the stuff you 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 repeat during the interview, you'll always have you'll always have this courtesy bias. So, one way of avoiding that is sometimes having this kind of um, online surveys where it's completely anonymous because then people kind of feel a little bit more free to give their actual opinion. But there's still this kind of stuff at play and it's really, really complicated to kind of get out of that. You just need to be aware of when you ask for someone's opinion that you can't like just take what they say and uh, see this as a truth because of those biases. Uh, there's another bias that is super interesting is the negativity bias is the fact that you recall uh, uh, much more uh, like a bad memories like do you remember the last time you declare your taxes or you talked about your ex usually you just remember bad things about it you don't you don't think about like yeah it was you, you think it was a really really bad conversation but with my ex but it wasn't like yeah but the the quality of the communication was good you don't remember that you just remember the bad things and basically the fact that people also focus on the negative comments uh like on even just one negative comments or the thousand of positive comments it's like you know when you've put you post a picture online everybody's just like oh like 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 and then you've got like what happened to your face? And it's just like, you just remember that, you just forget about all the positive things. And um, and this this is a, a bias that can impact a lot your, your user, but also you, because if you've got just one uh, negative comment, you will probably change all your design because you think like, yeah, this people is, is right, this is this is bad. But maybe like on the on the number of people that were like give you a, a positive feedback, you just you also uh, need to to focus on that. And there's um, uh, also uh, uh positivity bias which is like the total opposite but it's the same <laughs> way of working and basically the positivity bias it's a it's a good example for people with tattoos because nobody will ever go back to get another tattoo if you just remember only the bad things <laughs> so sometimes you do remember about the experience the fact that you discussed with a tattooer the fact that you have had uh, you had ice cream after that maybe and you just remember <laughs> that that when you go back to get another tattoo it hurts. It really, really hurts that your brain just tries to uh, make you forget about all this negative experience and try to, to focus on the best. So it really depends on uh, the context. And sometimes it can be the, the negativity bias that takes uh, much more uh, weight. And sometimes it's the positivity bias. But those two biases are super, super uh, can influence you a lot. Really. And then we've got the, I think it's the last category. Yeah, it's um, the teamwork and social meeting. So these biases will affect the people behave as a group and will influence them like at work or in the real life. So this is the kind of thing that will affect mostly designers, but also your users if, if they are in a group and discussing between each other. So not invented here and I, uh... I aged. I think this is the one I, I prefer, like I mean, the list of my preferred base. So it's uh, aversion to contact with or use already existing products or uh, standards or knowledge developed outside the group because of their external origins. This is something a lot of developers have, like, uh, no, we can't use that external script. But why? Because we didn't develop it ourselves. But why? It might have um, security issues. But why? Because we didn't do it ourselves. But why? <laughs> so it's something like that. And it's amazing because we did this workshop in, in Luxembourg. And there, were, there was a guy and he was a developer. I, I asked him and he said, I don't really understand the not invented here. And um, he said, it's, uh, I say, OK, I tried to explain it to him. He's like, 
Yeah, but it's normal. It's like, why is it normal? Say, so, yeah, because if the code is not uh, developed inside the company, it's normal that it, it don't want to use it. So I did the five whys, and it was really funny because everyone around was basically seeing what I was doing. <laughs> so they were all like smiling, seeing that this guy was so deep into the not invented here bias that he was not even aware of that. And at some point, I kind of stopped torturing him because it was not, not really fun. But still, and I said, maybe think about the why, because if you really dig about why is the code that is produced outside of your company less good, has security uh, issues or something like that, it's basically a bias because the code produced inside your company can be as good or as bad as the, this other code. So this is um, a, a really annoying one, uh, especially when working with developers, because at some point, if you have to redevelop every tool internally, <laughs> it can take a lot of uh, time and a lot of money as well. React uh, yeah, React is kind of fun as well. Um, it's the huge to uh, do the exact opposite of what uh, people uh, tell you to <laughs> to do. So I, I think I would never work in IT if my parents did not tell me to do not touch the computer because <laughs> it was uh, not allowed for girls at this time. And um, this kind of bias can, can be used like uh, on reversed uh, in order to many people, people during meetings or also kids or pets, but uh, mostly people during the meetings. I use that sometimes. Uh, and uh, a good example of reactants that we've got uh, right now at the global level is just the anti-mask and anti-vaxxers. Uh, that they're just choosing the, the, the exact opposite of what uh, the health organizations are telling them to do. And uh, this is a, a bias that should be uh, super careful with because people can like, are naturally uh, doing the, the, the exact opposite of what you can advise them. And, uh, and really this, this is fucked up. <laughs> the fucked up bias mm. but uh, just be really really careful with that one because if you try to do it on reverse it can just end up with the the worst uh, meeting ever as well but uh it can sometimes works it, it really depends you have to try and mm. see see what's uh, what's going out i got that uh, that backfired where we basically wanted to decommission a view and just because decommissioning meant forcing people to use something else, there was a lot of resistance at the user level. The, the meetings were, I'm not kidding, horrible. They were almost shouting at us that stuff was uh, missing. And when we said, okay, you know what, we're not going to decommission right away, all of a sudden, magically, the meetings became a little bit more chill, you know. So it's really this kind of, no, don't take away my friend something and it's a gut gut feeling so ah, it's me how to use the cards <laughs> so the goal um, of those cards is really teaching purpose so to help the team members become aware of your own biases uh, to do also aware of the different biases they can induce with uh, the users and other people in the team so it could be kind of a cheat sheet as a kind of reminders uh, to have them somewhere on the desk or something when sometimes uh, I have a really strange meeting, I'm like, what happened? And then I remember some of those kind of social biases and I'm like, ah, yeah, no, it's super obvious what happened is because of that and that and people work like that and things. So, so uh, in order to work with the cards <laughs> or play with the cards, first, the step zero is just download the card and cut them. So uh, if you don't have this kind of really, really nice unicorn scissors, just ask to an, uh, for an adult to help you cut out so that you don't uh, injure yourself. And if you don't have any uh, adult around, you can just use the online version that uh, <laughs> Stephanie showed before. So that is the first step. The second step, so the real first first step is just when you've got the card, you can distribute the cards to groups uh, or individuals. So usually you we try to uh, separate people with groups of, uh, let's say, between uh, five and ten because they can uh, exchange and discuss a bit about the cards. And the goal is just more or less just what we did before. Uh, we show you some cards that we uh, uh, preferred and we recall some uh, memories and experience, and they have to find some um, examples and discuss uh, all together about their ex the example and things that they, they might have encountered before. So uh, usually just take uh, 
10, uh, 10 minutes are good so that people can uh, uh, read all the cards, ask, ask questions. Uh, what we do usually, uh, we, we did <laughs> with Stephanie uh, when we, we do that, uh, is just uh, we uh, go around the tables and discuss with them and answer this, their questions because, uh, you know, you put all the uh, things uh, in the card uh, to explain like the little text on the card is quite short and sometimes they need more explanation. So that's that's the first step. Then we've got the uh, second step. Like uh, yeah, it looks like this. So yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. What? I think you missed one, uh, one, ah, one slide. Ah, yes. Yeah, this sorry. one. <laughs> yeah. So when when <laughs> they, they took some time to uh, discuss all together in groups, uh, you can uh, ask them so that maybe one person present maybe two or maybe three, let's say uh, ma maximum, but uh, two, two maximum is good. Two cards to all the uh, attendees and then they, they present uh, the, the bias like we just did with some real life example like we just did. And uh, this can take uh, three to, uh, two to three minutes per group. So take some time because if you have many groups, it's going to take some time for the, the, mm -hmm. the recall and uh, sharing. So this is the, the session that we did in uh, Paris Web. That was the uh, seven, 70 people. And um, so it's kind of a two step workshop. So once step one is complete, now you have like, let's say five group, each group presenting two biases. So you have at least 10 biases in the room. Plus we give them access to the website so they can see all of the other biases. So usually they have like 20 or something biases in mind. Then it's time to become evil. So we put people back into group or in videos if you have a really small group. And we asked them uh, to imagine the most manipulative experience possible. Uh, and the idea is they need to use as many biases as possible. So it's those from the cars, those they already know, those they have in the cheat sheet on the website. And we asked them to build something. Um, usually we, uh, what we did so far, we asked them to sell us a unicorn. And we didn't really say, okay, do a website or something. So it's interesting. Some people did an advertisement. Some people decided the unicorn was a, a, um, a mobile app or something. And uh, so what they have to do is basically fit as many as those biases in their um, kind of um, product or website or interface to sell as a unicorn. And one trick for them is we usually tell them note uh, on a piece of paper all of the biases you're using because we are going to ask you to present your concept. And every time you are going to use a bias, you either you or you have a second person with you is going to tell this is this bias, this is this bias. So this is usually like 15 or 20 minutes. And then we ask them to share. So each group comes back, we bring everybody in the same room and uh, each group presents their um, their um, kind of uh, how they want to sell us a unicorn and we count the points. So every, uh, po every bias is a point. The trick here, if you ever do that is uh, usually, and it's kind of a little bit sad, but the group that is the last one is going to win because they will just hear all of the biases and discover they also have this kind of bias and quickly note down, okay, we have this one and this one. So you don't want to be the first group to present here unless you're super good at that. But usually, yeah, the last or the, the two last groups have the most biases because they will have her, like listen to the other presentation and like adding, uh, added a few. Uh, so this exercise is biased, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's still a lot of fun. So usually, yeah, you have one person presenting while the other one is just like shouting the biases and we, we take notes. And it was super fun last time we did that. So we had people who use, uh, we didn't talk about the, the rhyme biases, but the rhyme basis is if it rhymes, it um, usually people believe in it. Like an apple a day keeps the doctor away something like that and it, so we had people who made us a song and it's horrible and it because we had this like they played so much on this like rhyme bias that the, the next day we still had their like all of their selling points for this unicorn with all the all the bases in our head and I think yeah, I it was stuck in song. my head for one week yes <laughs> it was a nightmare but it was so, real, and they won <laughs> they won so yeah and then you're like, okay, uh, who's the most evil group? Of course. 
Uh, so what about remote workshop? Um, a few things. Uh, if you want to do this uh, workshop remotely, you need a tool with a uh, voice. Uh, you need a chat, which is always nice, but also you need breakout, breakout rooms because you want to put the people in small little group uh, for the uh, exercise. You can put the boards on uh, the cards on boards like Miro, Mural, or I don't know if there's other tools like that. Also, you might want to have a nice breaker to help people get uh, comfortable with the remote tool. Uh, maybe I can share it. So what I prepared, what we prepared is basically, I can send you the link. Of course, Miro is completely. Uh, so the not fun part, the fun part about Miro is I can share something with you and you'll have, all have access. The not fun part is you'll all have access so you can all mess this up. So please, if you use that, copy it <laughs> in your board first. Otherwise, it will be a, uh, a big mess for everyone. I will try to have that as a Miro template at some point. But yeah, so this is the little, oh, it doesn't like, sorry. Uh, connection is going to be... Come on. So we have like the biases, you have how to use the card. So there's an explanation of the workshop, a few advice. Uh, tuk, tuk, tuk. Oh, <laughs> I should not have shared that. Ah. An explode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for anyone who, there, who has vestibular disorder. This is going to move uh, around a lot. Oh, my connection doesn't like that. Okay, I'm going to try to show you basically the, the little thing. Uh, I'm giving up on closing that. Uh, I apparently decided that you can... Ah, skip completely. Who implements a drop down on top of a close button? Anyway, <laughs> so we have a small icebreaker. So I like this one, but you do you. So this is basically, I ask people to take a post-it and say what uh, work they do today, uh, what their first paid job ever was. So it usually gives some interesting stuff. This is just so that people get used to the tool, move around post-its and stuff like that. So really like a uh, low stakes, stakes, small exercise. And then you just have to follow the, um, the links. So explaining the five categories, then the, it's exactly what I explained to you before. We are going to put you into small groups. You will be uh, able to uh, basically have a, a few cards. So this was designed for um, five, four groups. So at this point, you need to split them in small little groups. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> Everything is moving around. Uh, and here they just have like the post-its and they can drag and drop the explanation with a post-it on the, the different uh, cards. So I think we said 10 minutes, then uh, we bring them in the same room, um, ask them to present. And then the let's evil exercise. So we asked uh, to sell a unicorn. So here again, uh, the cool thing about Miro is that you have actually stuff like, oh, I have the, the picture on top of it. But you can use like uh, Unsplash pictures. There's a... Uh, uh, wireframes, there's emoji, so whatever they want to use in this uh, little app, uh, they just can drag and drop here. So it's really kind of this board where you can have a lot of fun. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> evil uh, sharing, uh, we bring them back together. And then, of course, we count the points and the whole of evil fame is if they want to put their name here for the people who won the most um, evil uh, group. And then what we'll have just after that is uh, kind of trying to have an open discussion on ethics. So that's the idea. Uh, this is a prototype. We want to try that one day uh, online. We, oh, I have so, so many things around. So we haven't completely tried that online yet. I've tried a few uh, remote workshops, but not with that template. So yeah, we might host that at some point with a few people who want to, to train the method out and we'll see how it goes. Oh, me. No, I can pass those. Okay, ethics. You want to take that one, Laurence? Uh, I think that's yours. <laughs> there's, yeah. A, yeah, there's a fox in the corner. <laughs> okay. 
but I just thought as you wish. <laughs> yeah, I, I can continue. So basically, uh, the ethical because you saw that all those biases can have like a lot of influence on to, of your on your users. If you if even if you don't lie to them or uh, if uh, even if uh, you don't lie to a group of people, uh, they uh, can interpret that and they can take decisions. And taking decisions sometimes is just like okay, I can buy something for one dollar and that doesn't have like a lot of impact but sometimes it can be like uh, maybe it's just buying a house or choosing holidays or things like can cost money it can be like a lot of influence and so sometimes for good you can use them and that's a good idea but also you can use those all those biases uh, like for evil <laughs> and um, you uh, as a designer you're just not putting colors everywhere we all know that that just uh, that's not our job but you've got like the responsibility because if you choose to select like maybe one or more let's say even some biases like just uh, booking uh, this will be your responsibility because users will take decision based on what you show to them and uh, that's important to take that into account and so we have a small question is like would you use the, some of those uh, in a project so if you want to uh, just uh, maybe I don't know if you can raise your hand and take like discuss with us and have like uh, what you really think about all those biases and would you use them just go ahead and tell us don't be shy <laughs> If you want to unmute yourself, I think they can, can they? Yeah, if anybody is willing to answer this question, please feel free to um, come in and also anyone on the team. Oh, I see a hand. Yeah, this is Danielle. Um, yes. I'm, I'm at school at Pratt and I think I would um, just from a behavioral perspective because you, as as part of being UX designers, I would think that we would want to condition people to do certain behaviors or incentivize people to to do certain things um while this is i think cognitive biases feels more like a intertwined a bit with marketing it still it, it influences the users to do what you want um and if it's buying a, a additional uh, room that's increasing revenue for the company it's what they want us to be doing is is showcasing how we can add value from a revenue perspective. So I think it makes sense to use it um, in some instances, but possibly but using it sparingly. <laughs> yeah, Not I think that's the point. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, thank you so much, Danielle. That was great. Anybody um, else anybody want to <laughs> tell us? What's the exact question? Would you use some of those biases, uh, that the one that we presented uh, today in uh, one of your projects, like in your daily work of our clients? Um, I'll speak a little bit. Hi, everyone. My name is Trang, and I do want to like piggyback off of what Danielle said. But when you're working on a project, um, and there are some initiatives that have to do with revenue and generating revenue. It's like you do have some goals that you have to meet. And so you're trying to like um, propose a flow for your users and to accomplish that goal, like you're gonna have to impose like your own biases. So it's, we're just trying to control a little bit of what users can do to kind of like help meet our objectives. And so it's a little, um, I guess, black and white. If we do say it's like, oh, it's evil or good. It's like, you know, everybody has their own goals, right? So in a way we're trying to help users achieve theirs, but from a business standpoint, it's like we have our own um, needs as well. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that was great. I, I also have something um, from Amber over here um, that says, I will happily make something bizarre so people can remember it better. So I like definitely, I can totally see that. I feel like <laughs> there's this like good and evil too biases. And I feel like too, it's like the intentionality of them is so important. So um, yeah, I think also here, um, Melissa says, one example I see all the time 
is the um, effect, the recency effect slash bias. Like looking at the hero of a website and seeing a CTA section near the end, usually it's the content you want people to remember or drive action to. Um, and also Mark says, we can use them in a positive way to manage stakeholders. Um, and Victoria says manipulation can be both good and bad. Um, and so, yeah, there's all these other ones too. Um, I'm going to do a few more. Um, Kim says, yes, I have insurance to sell. Um, so using <laughs> For an yeah, e I guess you don't have the choice if you are in the insurance uh, business. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, yeah, Suraj says something really interesting. Maybe we can use it in an ethical way, in such a way the expected business impact mm -hmm. is met, and at the same time the user need is met, which is really interesting. Um, I agree. Yeah, and I think one more that I'll do is from Victoria, and Victoria says Disneyland purposely makes their park. <laughs> round so people continue to walk around that's manipulating people but not necessarily in a bad way um so that's really cool that's a very interesting perspective that i didn't even think about um because you know it's not just user experience on the screen right um so that's awesome and um yeah i feel like we can go ahead to any other um slides that you have okay so the next one is about uh, as a designer, uh, we ask you, please, uh, when you when you are familiar with all the biases, like uh, the, the list and the one that we presented in the card, be aware of your own biases that can uh, influence your user when you do, for example, is user interview, because uh, now what you did, we just talked about. Uh, all this, you have no excuse to forget about that. Uh, for example, the confirmation bias is just like the way you ask your questions for a user interview. Uh, if you ever uh, did uh, some user interview, you don't ask the question like, do you think this website is good? <laughs> because people will tend to tell you, uh, yes, yes, it is good. Do you think it fulfills your need? So like, yeah, I guess so. And basically this is the confirmation bias and it can be like, a, it, it's really destructive and you've got to like, the results might be better for you, but it won't be right and it won't be correct and it won't be the, the, the reality. So we've got like a confirmation bias, the frame if, uh, frame if effect, framing effect social desirability bias. And we've got like, there's a list, uh, if we share the the, uh, the slide of uh, uh, super nice uh, sure. article about like the 10 cognitive biases to avoid in user research and how to avoid them. So <laughs> please, as a designer, read that. That's super, uh, super instructive and uh, you will discover many, many things. Uh, uh, then so yeah, resource. Yeah, we've got some resources. So uh, before we did our own deck, uh, we found uh, th those two decks that we uh, I'm gonna present you. Uh, the one is from uh, Dash and Thompson. Uh, it's all the cognitive biases cards. So there's like really nice designs with uh, illustrations and uh, uh, this descriptive text. And it's really good for, for biases in general, but not really around the uh, UX or IT, uh, like uh, constructing website apps or experiences. So uh, it can be for it's it's a much larger maybe for um, um, let's say marketing people in general, uh, but it's it can be helpful and there's some of the bias that is in in, in common uh, with uh, ours, but uh, not all of them. And we've got also another deck from uh, Sitback, uh, which is also a bit different from the one before and also different from ours and also mm -hmm. uh, not uh, oriented about, around UX and making apps or websites. So those two uh, decks of, car uh, of cards are free and you can just download and print them. And it's, uh, if, you, if you really love uh, <laughs> biases cards, just <laughs> print them all. <laughs> Go ahead. Um. That's an amazing book by uh, David Dylan Thomas uh, about cognitive biases as well. And this is applied uh, to uh, to the web and to the design, but he also talks a lot about other experiences. Like there's this chapter on uh, biases on resumes and uh, things like that. So it's uh, he doesn't have like this section. He doesn't go bias by bias. He kind of more tells a story around different biases and how it's going to influence. But it's a really great book. A lot, a lot uh, of uh, super amazing example uh, to go beyond kind of uh, only the biases in UX design and um, digital um, 
digital project. And yeah, there's link. <laughs> not, we, we will give you the presentation, so don't worry. So we put a lot of link. If you want really to go a little bit uh, deeper and further, there's a lot of, of uh, documentation on the topic. And this book uh, on psychology in general, so uh, Psychology for Designer by Joe Leach, I think it's free or uh, if you're a student and you email him, I'm pretty sure he will give you the book. So he's a really nice guy. Uh, Susan Wenshenk has two books, like 100 things and 100 more things. It's two different books. It's not like a second edition of the, the first one. So those are also like psychology theory to help you go a little bit further into that topic. And that's it. And if you ever want to come to Luxembourg or present a workshop at UX in Lux, yes, <laughs> which when, is uh, when life go, go, comes back to normal, I yeah. guess. <laughs> or remote <laughs> workshop if you want. Uh, yeah, we're also always open. Now. We would absolutely love to do that. I really wish I could visit Luxembourg because I've never been anywhere near there. So that's awesome. <laughs> Um, thank you so much um, for spending this morning with us. I know that we are at time, but I would love if you both still have the time to answer some questions that um, our viewers have. Yeah, sure. um, I'm going to go first um, from the most recent one from Danielle. And Danielle says, if you're manipulating people to care more about the environment, mm -hmm. is that evil? <laughs> and, yeah. It depends who you ask. If you ask someone who doesn't think climate change exists, they would say, yeah, it's evil because you're manipulating them into something that doesn't exist, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on your moral, moral compass or things like that. So yeah. it's, you, know, you can never say, yeah, it's evil. I think climate change exists and <laughs> I don't think it's evil if you try to nudge people into caring about that more. But uh, yeah, it always depends so it on, depends on the purpose and the context. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I feel like something that I'm easily learning too is just like I it's it depends. <laughs> like really the answer is it depends. And it's yeah, depends, always. It really depends on your user. So that's really interesting. And that kind of nods to Daniel's um uh, question where it's like are there are, are there scenarios for when cognitive biases can be used for good you know I would say like with that example from yeah. the, um, Danielle so there's Daniel and Danielle so Danielle talking about the environment of course in my opinion as someone who um, loves and wants climate change to not <laughs> um, happen like I would say that that's for good right but you know like you said someone can have a different opinion um, and uh, Nandia asks, I know a lot of these biases, but I'm often fooled. How can I stay conscious and how can I fight them daily? Hmm. I would suggest to uh, maybe I would say print out the deck of cards, maybe not only hours, the other hours, and just look at them uh, from time to time. Just uh, pick a card every morning and look at them, and maybe you will just recall uh, it a bit more. Uh, we all get uh, really influenced by those bias. Uh, it's it's natural, you know. It's the way your brain is 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 just working, and uh, you know, as we said. Just, even if we are looking at booking and we know there are biases and even like sometimes, you know, the number of people looking at this, uh, this, uh, this room uh, at the same time is really high. We, we kind of know maybe it's just a script and there's like nobody looking at it and maybe the, the number is random, but still you just feel like, oh, yeah, I need to hurry. And it's, this is just a natural uh, way of behaving, but just to be uh, conscious of that and just to realize it exists and it can influence you, it's already, uh, already a big step. And uh, just try to, uh, for, for example, the, the one that is uh, affecting the, 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 the uh, uh, the designers in general, uh, just try to look at them uh, a bit more than the other because <laughs> this is influencing you directly. And um, and this uh, every time you are doing an interview, just uh, look at them quickly sometimes, just a, a bit before or when you are uh, writing your questions or for, for the interviews, it, it can help a, a bit. Yeah. I can't imagine trying to like overwhelm yourself, you know, with like all of this stuff. Cause you know, everybody, I feel like 
everyone in this room wants to be as an informed designer and as a, you know, a designer that, you know, like is able to make everybody happy. Um, but I feel like, like you said, the first step is just the most important step. And I think that just having this conversation with you both is such a great first step for all of us and myself included. Like we were talking about Disneyland and how it's round. And I was just like, wait, that is manipulative. And I'm like, oh no, yes. so much. Oh, is that yeah. good? You know, is that bad? Um, and so, I, um, so we have another question um, from Maxime and Maxime asks, how do you personally um, proceed to counter the Ikea effect on your own design? I would say uh, I don't uh, try to fight, uh, fight. The, the, the question is how do you do, do, you do to uh, fight this yeah. bias, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest that some of those biases, like the IKEA effect, is not something to fight, but something to use. Uh, like, for example, <laughs> trying to uh, help people, like maybe if it's like, like a let's say uh, your um, uh, concurrent is trying to is putting like a lot of uh, things to uh, custom or a lot of uh, personal f features maybe just do so <laughs> just, and um, yeah I, I would not fight it I'd, I, I would totally use it on my side <laughs> I think teamwork it's the same uh, as the question before like how do you make sure I you avoid your own biases is uh, you need someone else sometime to point it out so if uh, by ikea effect is uh how do you avoid falling in love your with your own designs because you designed it yourself is basically review feedback teamwork and it, it's the same for any bias like when you're doing user research you want to have someone who will uh read your uh, not the transcript the um, uh, I have the word in French crap. Uh, yeah, the, um, when you are uh, uh, writing your questions and things like that, usually your uh, research kind of, um, tr uh, not the transcript, but you want someone to go through this and say, oh, actually this question is biased or this question right. is not open. And I think it's it's the same for the, the, the IKEA effect about falling in love with, with your own design. You need other people to hold you accountable. And this is why I think it's an interesting exercise to do with uh, with the teams. Like I spent so much time explaining to my business analyst and even my, my developer, those biases like, yeah, you know, this meeting uh, went wrong because of that and that. And no, they kind of, it's this, uh, oh, cannot be, but cannot be unseen effect, which is no, they understand also a little bit better. And so if they are aware of those biases, they might be able to say, ah, uh, Stephanie, don't you think like this is uh, also kind of a, a bias or, so, or something like that? So yeah, teamwork, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can say myself, like for a, like a design challenge that I had to go through, I asked Vicky, I was like, hey, is this good? And she was like, she would tell me right away. And I think like just having this kind of support system too, as a design community and what mm -hmm. I hope to also instill in everybody, like there's a way to be able to have these conversations, but I think it's in our, also our responsibility to be able to have these like response, that these conversations respectfully and like knowing that we are trying to help each other, um, you know, in our learnings in, in, you know, maybe like you said, Stephanie, for the, for the, in the, the meeting that you had, like you, there's a light bulb moment, but without you being able to respectfully show that and say that, then you know, where would you be? Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of also answers Jen's question about, you know, the approaches and ways you can use to check um, your findings and insights, teamwork, collaboration, that sounds like all really great answers. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing too that Vicky has Diverse is... teams. <laughs> <laughs> Diverse teams with people oh, who don't look God. and act yeah, like you. <laughs> Diverse teams. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyways. And, Vicky asks, um, how can we remove biases from the research um, phase before going into design? Um, and she, you know, Vicky asks, you know, would these cards help? And I'm pretty sure they would, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. If you if you just look at them uh, just uh, regularly uh, and just when you think like maybe when you have a doubt, just look at the cards, find the bias that you think it's it's applying here and maybe just uh, try to avoid it. <laughs> It's it's really not easy. Let's be honest. Uh, when now that you are aware that it exists, you will see. You will really feel that it it just exists. Like every time you create a question, every time you do a, like a single button or a, anything you do, you feel like oh, 
is it a bias or like uh, is it, uh, I, am I trying to manipulate the users? So sometimes it's just for good or sometimes it's just for evil. But um, from the preparation of all your like the the, the first phase of the design, it's uh, you you just need to be aware of that. Maybe uh, do the uh, do the workshop with your colleagues. Just show them what it exists, like all the bias that can exist, and make make them also aware of those biases. And maybe if you are not aware of that, as we say, like collaboration and also diversity, maybe somebody else will think about like, oh, maybe you this is bad. We shouldn't do this. And <laughs> if you are not alone to know about that, it's way better. But it's 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 really hard to try to avoid everything like. Every time it's you, you, we are humans, you know, uh, before, before yeah. everything. So you, humans make mistakes and that happens. You need to be kind to yourself at some point. Like even I sometimes listen to my own interview. I'm like, why did I ask this question? I'm biasing that person <laughs> by asking this question. Like, why did I do that? Ah, or sometimes you, like the question goes out of your mouth. It's like, oh crap, too late. So yeah. I think it's practice. Like the, the 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 longer you do that, the better you get at not asking uh, closed questions and th things like that. So it's just yeah. practice, and uh, yeah, eventually, <laughs> you know, you, it's kind of a lo a long road for a lot of students. But so just be kind with yourself, and yeah, if there's an interview where you're like, oh. It's, this question I shouldn't have asked it or I clearly biased uh, the person usually I take note in in the transfer cap say oh this answer is biased and we can't really use it or it's fine it happens to everyone <laughs> don't sweat it yeah yeah absolutely I think you know something that um, you've resurfaced or just I mean maybe resurfaced for some people but surfaced for me is like it's so important to recognize like to be kind to yourself and be patient as you're learning. And I think that, like you said, it's a muscle that you have to keep exercising mm -hmm. in order to, um, you know, be good at it. So I think now everyone in this um, event, if you were here with us, like, I feel like this is just such a great first step. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. We are so grateful to be able to have our first, I would say our first like international speakers, like thank <laughs> so much Luxembourg. for um, <laughs> in and being able to be a part of this event. Um, so thank you everyone as well who was able to attend. Um, make sure again to tag us, tag Stephanie's tech, tag Lawrence in um, their LinkedIn, in our LinkedIn, on their social media, on our social media. So please, please go ahead and do that. Thank you again. And I hope everybody has a beautiful weekend. Bye. Bye.